Welcome to Denby Does Dharma. I have two very special local guests from the northern beaches here where I live, Matilda Brown and Scott Gooding. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. And to the big fish in the background as well. <laughs> we have um, we have basically Australian film royalty meets UK publican protege. And uh, <laughs> I was trying to find a way of... Uh, I love knowing the backstories of people and how people meet, especially for you guys being from such you know similar but also diverse backgrounds and two big industries really uh, here and obviously overseas. So um, do you mind sharing how you guys actually met before we get started just so people can understand? Um, <clears throat> well, do you want the, the real version or the... What? We both, in both our wedding speeches, we delivered... Part of it, a big chunk of both of our wedding speeches is how we met. Actually, Till went first and mm -hmm. pretty much hijacked a third of my speech by saying how we met. So I had to like. No, put it, put they were very, they were very different. Um, but but um, it, we'll we'll do the condensed one because <laughs> it's quite a long story and we don't have long. Yeah. But um, basically, we met through years ago in Bondi at a cafe through a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. um and Scott walked in and he had this like really funny haircut shave sides like cockatoo kind of cut kind of look I always called it the cockatoo haircut mm -hmm. and he had the singlet on and his tats and I <laughs> I thought I thought nothing of him um but I thought he looked like a bit of a wanker <laughs> that, was, that was my two cents on screen um and and after that we probably saw each other in the streets um you know, over the next sort of four or five years and just sort of were like, hi, hi, but didn't really have a conversation at all. And I, so I thought, it's funny how you can get first impressions so wrong because I thought he was arrogant um, and a wanker. And, <laughs> and, then I actually, and then I actually had a conversation with him, you know, six years on from that first meeting mm -hmm. and couldn't have been further from the truth about Scott. He's definitely not a wanker. And he's so far from arrogant. Yeah. So it took it took a long time for us to go on a first date. Um, but yeah, once we did, I was sort of at the point in my life, I guess six years on from that, which well, um, oh, no, to say to I mean, is everything. You've missed out. We actually met on a podcast. Oh, okay. I was I was hosting a podcast and it was within my within my industry, you know, I'd done sort of a dozen episodes and they're always fitness people, health people. And I got to a point, I was like, this is going to get pretty limited. You know, in Australia, there's not that many people in that space. Mm. And also it doesn't define me. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm curious about other walks of life and people. So I started to branch off and I, I spoke, I got a actor and then I, it, that was a lot of fun and then an entrepreneur. And then I was like, I'd been following Teal on Instagram and what she was saying was like diff a lot different to what other people were saying. Like mm. she had a curiosity around about her and I was like, oh, I reckon she'd be an, you know, an interesting person to have on your podcast. So uh -oh. <laughs> I reached out. She, she was the first to say, look, I'm not in health and fitness. Like doesn't really make sense. I was like, no, it's fine. I'm sort of branching out. Mm. Um, anyway, we sat down for probably an hour and a half and, um, I guess that was our first real hmm. uh, conversation. conversation. And then, yep. and um, then four and months then... later, we moved in together. Oh, wow. That quick. Wow. Yeah. It was pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. I was at the point in my life where I was really ready to meet the person. Yeah. Well, you're lucky you found one of the good ones in that um, that Bondi mix <laughs> there, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> that, and that's a myth. That's a myth. <laughs> well, I, I did a stint in Bondi. I was when I was pregnant. I was living in Bondi, so um, and lots of good people, of course, there as well. And you can say that about anywhere as well, too. But um, that's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just inspiring, I think, because when you see people who have already got you know, profile and and family connections, and they've already been like Matilda, you've done lots of films, obviously, and been in film, TV. You're in Offspring, which is one of my favourite shows. I remember watching that when that first started, and and of course, My Kitchen Rules for you, Scott. Was that during the days when you was that after My Kitchen Rules? You did the podcast or at the same time? Yeah, oh. no, uh, quite a quite a few years after. So we filmed MKR in 2012. That aired early 13, and I when did we when did we meet? 2017. So another four years or so. 
God, where does that time go? Isn't it frightening? Especially when you have kids, you know, you, I've got a 16 year old now and you look back and just go, where did that time go? I don't know. I, yeah. I, well, my middle one turns four in a couple of weeks and it's just like, you know, it just seems yesterday we were, he was coming into this world and we were changing yeah. nappies and all that stuff. Like it just goes so quick. Yeah. You guys are still in the battlefield though for another couple of years, I hate to tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we know it. <laughs> We're both at daycare today. So we're, um, yeah. it's one of those those days where you actually like, you get to breathe, but then you, this sort of comes a point where you're like, all right, I guess I can come home now. <laughs> I'm kind of ready for the chaos again. Yeah. In space. Yeah. Well, you've both had, um, you know, your own health journeys, of course, and this is a great thing when you do become parents. That, you know, ideally, you've been through a lot of your own shifting and had your own journeys before, whether it's health or relationship or, you know, other things, even work-wise. But and I, I'll start with you, Scott, because um, your your story and also yours as well, Matilda, is really interesting. And, and I'd like you to touch a bit, not too much, obviously, Scott, because you do in the book, um, The Sustainable Diet, I'll do a few plugs, <laughs> um, of keto and paleo diets. And of course, I remember back in the day with, you know, the Atkins diet, and there's been so many different ways of how is the best way to eat. And then, of course, when we get to you, Matilda, um, you know, with the veganism and the vegetarianism, which I've been through too. So, what was your health journey? What was the thing that sort of kickstarted you, Scott, into becoming more aware about what you were putting into your body and, and how you're looking after yourself? Um, it, it, was, it was sort of born out of adversity more than anything. So I, all my life I'd been like the, the fit guy, the help. Well, yeah, I'd always been the fit guy. Hmm. I trained most days. I trained indiscriminately. You know, I, I sort of flogged my body pretty hard. And, and had done since the day I could run probably or day I could walk mm -hmm. played a lot of sport and then that got sort of um a rudely interrupted one day when I was working for a guy I was digging a trench so no, nothing um it wasn't like a dramatic accident or a car crash or anything like that it was just days re repeatedly digging clay like soil mm -hmm. And I and I remember, you know, on the whatever the four thousandth twist of this shovel, my my I heard an audible pop or crack in my back. Mm. What I'd done in that instance was ruptured discs. Ouch. And I, I'd never had a back injury. I'd never really had any any significant injury injury really. Um, so what it meant to me was that for the rest of that day, you know, I was in a lot of pain and discomfort and I got myself home but I thought my logic was well I'll just probably have to have a few days off the gym or not run for a couple of days and by Monday I'll be I'll be right mm -hmm. but that that wasn't the case and so I entered into this seven year period of my life that was marked by pain and discomfort and then because of those two things it was very hard to be present and I would go to go as far as to say I I entered into pretty serious bouts of depression. I, I actually, it's very if anyone's listening, watching this or listening to this that's experiencing chronic pain in whatever form that is. For me, it was back. Like it, it's nigh on impossible to be truly present in that moment when that moment might be sitting with a friend or a relative or being at a restaurant or a cafe when you're contending with like, you know, I've got to get up in a second. I'm in, I'm in a lot of pain. Like it's just, yeah. so you, it's, it's not, just, it doesn't stop at the physical. It, it bleeds into the emotional and your whole well being. Totally. And so I guess having a, having a sciencey kind of mind and logic and a degree in exercise science I went on this path of trying to heal myself in a very mechanical, in a very mechanical method. So I'm trying to find the mechanical method that would heal me best. Because mm -hmm. I could see on the scans and the MRIs and the CT that there was a protruding discs, you know, there's three discs protruding. One was more significant than the other two. So I went down the path of, you know, chiros and physios and osteos mm -hmm. and and had no real, like, there were moments where you walk out and you go, oh, that feels a bit better. But then, you know, half an hour later, you're back to square one sort of thing. Yeah. Can I ask, can I just interrupt Scott and ask you which discs they were? Like, because I 
do all that sort of body works too. It's quite interesting to know because there's different emotions in different right right the most significant was l5 s1 yeah okay the two above that yeah yeah um cool go on um (laughs) and so all that time like so that's seven years i'm i'm trying to be trying to forge a career as a personal trainer and having boot camps and Mm. all the while not being able to do a push-up or a squat Mm. You know, so I felt very fraudulent. I felt a bit of an imposter. Um, and anyway, got to got to like the eighth year, and I had seen every everyone I thought I could see. You know, from you know, as I said, that sort of classical path that most people take: the chiro, the physio, the osteo. But I also saw you know Chinese uh, acupuncturists and um, healing hands you know I'm not particularly a religious guy but you know I was like right you know if you're claiming to have healing hands then I'm on board mm-hmm. anyway it it got to the eighth year and I started to read and I can't even particularly remember what the what the inspiration was at the time but I, I remember starting to read around foods that were anti-inflammatory and, mm. and pro-inflammatory and so it gave me the opportunity to look at my diet in a very sort of analytical way. And I could, and my diet wasn't, certainly wasn't terrible. Like I wasn't eating McDonald's and all that sort of stuff. You know, I was still trying to live a healthy lifestyle like most of us do. Mm-hmm. But I could see that there were some things that could probably be tidied up. And mm-hmm. you know, when, when you're looking at it from from that lens and that lens only, what what's pro-inflammatory, what's what's uh, anti-inflammatory there were certainly foods in in the pro-inflammatory basket that I went okay I'm I'm going to choose to not have those mm-hmm. and I became very militant about that so that's to your point earlier your question about the paleo that's when I went knee deep in the paleo diet yeah I became a I became very militant about it and I became a bit of a pain in the ass to be honest I was <laughs> you know I stopped not that I got many invitations but the invitations dried up to people's homes for dinner because I was the guy that wouldn't have that you know you know like it, yeah I became so what happened because I became the pain in the ass to have as a guest and I didn't really want to be the guy in the coffee shop or the cafe or the restaurant asking the waiter to ask the chef if he's put this or that in it so what it meant was to control everything that I put in my body I cooked it at home. Yeah. And so I started to cook, you know, I always cooked, but I, it was easier for me to cook at home rather than go to the cafe on that occasion or a restaurant. So pretty much like eight, 90 to a hundred percent of what I was consuming was made at home. Yeah. And so you start to develop a repertoire within that classification of food. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of where my, onboarding to looking at my diet in a very analytical way was was, okay. was came about yeah and see that's a good thing because once you've know, once you know what to cook at home you can take your own little packages to your friends dinner parties and instead of saying you can't eat this be one of those people yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think I think those of us who have been on any sort of healing journey, and certainly you know I'm a body therapist and a, a shamanic healer and yoga teacher. So all, certainly in my industry, uh, most of us come to the industry like you've just described yourself through some sort of injury or some sort of personal trauma, and then we put up, you know, we fall apart. We put, bring learn how what puts us back together, and then we want to sh- naturally as humans we want to share that with other people, don't we? Because we don't like to see other people suffering if they don't need to. Yeah, uh, if they and, take- I, and I think. You know, but if it hadn't come through as you're describing that path of adversity, may I have got there possibly? Would I have been as militant about it? You know, mm-hmm. like very firm parameters about what I was going to eat and what I wasn't. Yep. And then obviously with the with the effect that it had and and the time that has passed since then, it sort of shifted into this less militant you know, the parameters are a bit more sort of malleable yeah. and not as rigid. Yeah. And so now it's, it's still very health conscious and and watch what I eat, but it's not as, and so I wonder now, like, would I have even got there where, I, would I have even got here where I am now mm. if it hadn't come through that sort of real um, extreme version of, of 
yeah, the smack, smack in the head sort of thing. I think from from the spiritual perspective and what I've witnessed for decades of doing this type of work, I think most of us need a good whack on the head right. to make us take enough notice, whether it's an illness or an accident, car accident, divorce, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's to different degrees for most people. But again, it's you are learning the lesson of discipline, which we all have to learn when we're maturing anyway, don't we? So I can relate to that because when I first started doing my yoga teacher training, it was all macrobiotics, Scott. So it was just like, wow. and it was fully anal, like ridiculously anal. And all of us were just like, okay, we were told this is what we're allowed to eat. And it was seasonal based eating, which I still do. And that's what really attracts me to you guys as well, you know, supporting that that whole concept. But it was just so ridiculous. And we all just looked emaciated. And this is when I was like in my, my mid, no, late 20s. We just looked really unhealthy, even though we were supposedly eating the best things, you know, and aligning things for our gut. And it was before the days of gluten. No, no one really sort of knew about that, et cetera. So, yeah, I went from extreme discipline, so I can relate to that, to just going, fuck it, and not doing anything and just <laughs> eating all the things that I knew my body, you know, wasn't supporting it. Um, you know, it swung to the other end of the pendulum, which I'm sure you both can relate to as well through both your journeys and eventually coming back to somewhere, you know, now in my early 50s of like, oh, that's what works for Denby, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It just takes time. We're all on this on these yeah. journeys and, yeah. I mean, you look at addicts, you know, like drug addicts or mm -hmm. probably drug and alcohol are, the, are, are good examples that the shift then becomes, um, you know, they they control their vice, whether it's drugs or alcohol. And then it might be that they throw all that energy that they were applying to that vice mm -hmm. into looking at their diet, or it might be exercise. And they be, you know, you become, a, there's an extreme version of either or, you know, mm -hmm. and for such time that that kind of softens a little bit. And then you're in this, I mean, I'm glad I'm not there anymore, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how I, perceive food now is you know I wouldn't wouldn't say I'm militant by any stretch of the imagination there's there's you're definitely disciplined but you're not militant yeah yeah, yeah. Like, there's it's, free there's it's free amazingly yeah. disciplined like the things that I mean I think I have a healthy lifestyle but you know but then there's Scott um <laughs> and yeah my my health journey has been been you know a different one as well but um yeah well, let's, get, let's get to that Matilda because I, I know that you've been a vegan and a vegetarian and um I, I've heard your story of you know smelling the the slow roasting lamb stew <laughs> <laughs> and just like following your nose into the kitchen and having that being a transformative experience for you um yeah. and I can relate to that having been off meat for a long time and then being called back to it so can you share your journey um yeah so well um I grew up with I grew up very when I was sort of younger I was just always active um uh, a, a, you know a lean lean bean really um and then I got to my sort of got to like 12 and hit puberty pretty early and got boobs really early <clears throat> and put on you know put on some weight and my mum was a model um you know and, and you know cut, she comes from a very um <laughs> I don't want to throw my mom under the bus because she's an amazing, amazing woman. But basically, I remember the day when she said, um, you know, you're not allowed to eat ice creams anymore, basically. And then I was on diet after diet after diet. Um, and I come from home from school and there'd be like a new diet printed out on the table. Atkins diet was one of them. <laughs> um, and um, so I, I, I was kind of like lost about, with food through a lot of my teens mm -hmm. um and my weight fluctuated um all through my teens and until sort of until sort of probably around 23 when I discovered running and counting calories mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I basically developed an eating disorder yeah. I was sort of I was like oh this is how you get skinny cool and so I just ran every day 5ks without fail like it, the the um talk about militant like what my head would do if I could not run my 5ks mm. um you know and the things that I wouldn't do if I couldn't run my five if I knew I couldn't run my 5ks or like staying like, at like some that. guy's house and waking up it was even it had to be at seven o'clock you know waking up at seven o'clock and being like gotta go <laughs> gotta do my 5ks um like a form of punishment isn't it oh it's, it's such a form of punishment yeah my 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 
until really my until really Scott came into my life my body has just been punished um and I have just punished my body and um um and yeah so you know veganism was another form of I I went vegan in my mid-20s I was vegetarian sort of before that but then I watched I watched a bunch of documentaries um you know the everyone probably knows the ones I'm talking about the ones that kind of you watch and you're horrified at um like a fish cowspiracy all those sorts of things yeah I watched like four in a weekend and I was just (laughs) it's just like so overwhelmed um and then I became you know you know one of those vegans who at every dinner table where there was someone who wasn't it was you know my mission to convert them um uh yeah it was a pain in the ass to be around um and that's a common thread for both of you (laughs) (laughs) definitely we're not, the we're not fun at certain points in our life. Um, <laughs> but it was also, it was a, it was a, aside from the fact that I just didn't want to contribute to, you know, animals having a, that sort of life or subpar life. Um, I, it was a, it was a great, it, it hit an eating disorder. You know, it, I didn't have to eat what everyone else was eating. I could literally just eat, eat like air. You know, I could fill my plate with like, next to no calories as a vegan mm-hmm. um and I, I avoided all good oils and I, I wasn't like a I wasn't a healthy vegan that was eating great you know avocado and you know um knew what to put into their body I was I was very conscious of like this is a way for me to basically starve myself um yeah. and a lot of that was to do with being an actress a lot of that was mm. Um, you know, doing auditions and feeling like I needed to look a certain way and feeling like I needed to conform to a certain, um, you know, <laughs> a certain like character description, which is like pretty girl, fit, <laughs> you know, intelligent, whip smart, you know, those like things, which thank God they don't really do that anymore. But, you know, um, <laughs> without going too much down that um I used to work in the industry. I used to be a hair and makeup artist and a stylist for like 17 years before I got into yoga. So you totally know where you're at. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, but, but, but by the time Scott had entered my life, I was 30. I was sort of had my, had had my last trip to LA. I didn't know that it was my last trip, but I'd just come back from a really big trip in LA where I had been doing auditions and got really close to um selling a tv show and had had come back and and I was I was sort of um I was vegetarian at this point I wasn't a strict I wasn't vegan but I wasn't eating meat yet and I was just at the point where I just I didn't know what I should be eating I was like if okay if I'm vegetarian like what how do I get the protein that I'm supposed to have am I even supposed to have I was just so lost in the world of what what is healthy eating because I'd been on so many fad diets Mm. in my teens that there's like little bits from that that you remember and a little bit from that one that you remember and at the end of the day you're like (laughs) you know you've got this jumbled mess of what is good for you and what is not good for you and um and so my mum's voice in the background going don't avoid don't have yeah and my mum's voice constantly in the background exactly looking over my shoulder as I eat anything (laughs) um I don't want people to think like to feel like that you know that she's a horrible person for that because um she it was just the way that she you know it, it, it was unfortunate for her that she had that those th- those thoughts as well oh, yeah. um, in, in her defense my mum was, was the same as well I think there's a lot of women that will say exactly the thing because our parents are only um you know they're only handing down that you can only do what you, the best that you can do with the level of consciousness that you have at the time or the yeah, information yeah. That you have at the time yeah and and the uh, generations before us and our grandparents were you know three meat and one veg type of scenario in a lot of cases so yeah not not having a go at your mum at all she's she's ever watches this i know i know (laughs) i know know that there'll be people watching this thinking like oh i can't believe that how horrible and it's like you know she only she 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 loves me (laughs) she's the best (laughs) mum um we we all make you know we all do you know no one gets it all right as a parent anyway um (laughs) but yeah as you say it was how the experience she had as a kid, right? From no, her see, it was he was her, you know, it was her as a model. It was her as an actress. It was what she thought she had to fit into, as well. Um, yeah. So that, um, that's the pressure of the industry too. I mean, she's 
Um, yeah. Yeah, of course, for women in general, as you know, I mean, I, although we shouldn't really sort of say just men because that's a bit sexist. I mean, men also have a lot of pressure in the industry too to, to uh, manipulate their bodies, put on weight, lose weight for roles. And, and you know that with the clients that you see too, Scott, as well. A lot of men have just as many emotional, you know, food disorders type of psychological things going on as mm -hmm. um, as women do too. So, and when you become parents, you become, or I, I at least became really aware of like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I don't fuck my own child um, because oh, I'm acutely aware of how difficult it actually is to be a parent and, and all these things that if you haven't dealt with yourself yeah. or that you're struggling with coming from just this love of wanting your child to be the best that they can, yeah. we, no, don't, we, we, don't, we don't get it right all the time. So, and how, uh, and how yeah. such a, <laughs> you know, flippant comment can be so impactful for the, <laughs> for the kid, you know, like something that we don't put too much weight weight you know yeah. <laughs> Good one, yeah. but yeah. too much weight attached to it can be really like hurtful and you know set a bit of a, a way you know set a um you know ha has it can have a lot of gravity you know yeah. so yeah you got to be mindful it's a it's a bit of a it is a bit of a minefield actually Totally. I mean, it, it could have been worse, Matilda. You could you could have been encouraged to transition into a boy at the age of three. So, yeah, I, I, yeah I, um, that's positive. <laughs> I've realised since becoming a mum, um, you know that that yeah, as you said, you know, it's it's out of love that you and wanting that wanting the best for them that you you know that that's all you want. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when I when I when I met Scott, I was yeah sort of totally lost about well what I should be eating what I shouldn't be eating um and he came into my life and is a big meat eater um and it wasn't like in a at all in a pushy way but he would just sort of inquire about why I didn't eat meat um <clears throat> and you know I, I gave my reasons about I didn't want to contribute to a system of farming um that gave animals a subpar like I should also say that we have a farm that had and the cattle have always have a, had a really lovely life there. So I, for some reason, I couldn't equate that, um, <laughs> you know, I, I obviously just gone into my thing of, sort of thing. yeah, there was like a disconnect for me, but he, he was, he's always been um, very strong on food provenance. Um, and he, and he was very quick to say, well, I have a butcher that knows where his cows come from and they have a great life and he knows where, you know, he, he he sort of like gave me this concept of ethical butchers, which I hadn't really understand before um, or know about. And literally that day, I think I was so ready to eat meat when he when he was like, you know, we could we could go to the butcher if you want to just talk to him. If if you, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> let's go to the butcher. <laughs> He's already in the car. Oh, God. I'm so go ready. in there, stand there for a few moments, get used to it, walk out again, <laughs> go in again the next day, stand yeah, yeah. longer. So uh, we went and got a, a, a leg of lamb and he and he cooked it for like seven hours. Mm. It was the longest seven hours of my life, but it smelled <laughs> the smell of it wafting through the kitchen. And like finally, when he took it out of the oven and took the lid off and the meat just fell apart and the bone, like I just couldn't stop eating it. And it was like my body was like, you know, it was like WD-40 going into my bones. Like I felt like my brain started to work again. Like yeah. I really felt like I'd gotten to the point with my health where like even my brain, I think I deprived it of so much, so many good fats and and and, and protein and mm. that it was like, yeah. <laughs> I'd switched off. Yeah, conservative. <laughs> yeah. You, you can, a lot of people just describe that as it's almost like, coming online almost all of a sudden yeah. because yeah. the body is saying something different to what the psyche or maybe the belief systems etc in the mind are saying and but the body's saying please give this to me and yes yeah, so I, I can relate to that as well I'm a country girl guys I, we had a farm for like 35 years I grew up like you Matilda rolling in the dirt with chickens and you know I'm scraping the poo off the duck eggs and uh, we raised Murray Gray cattle for quite a few years there and, and, and crops to sell to market so um, I'm so grateful for that experience as a young child. I mean, every every child should you know have dogs, I reckon, or cats and pets, and and have that opportunity. Where would that then be? Um, up near St Albans, Wiseman's Ferry, in the Hawkesbury River, that area. Yeah, um, we only sold it in the last couple of years just because all our kids were getting older and we weren't using it as much. Um, not the same sort of property and uh, location as as your farm, but uh, in a beautiful valley with a river and 
just divine and you know we had horses and all that stuff but um you know I learned a lot then you know, back in the days where we were you know bedeezering the cattle and um doing all that stuff and we had a, a big bull that we could go up and hug in the paddock and, oh. and we were probably doing because when I was reading about you know, things about in your book as well as of which we'll get to farmers footprint and the whole regenerative farming thing my dad was actually doing that like 30 years ago without even realizing it we weren't using any fertilizers or anything like that we were we were you know having them in some paddocks and then letting other ones fallow and rest and not using fertilizers and things like that. And that was just, you know, a lot of people, and you'll be able to relate to this too, of course, when you get on the land and you walk barefoot in the earth and you open your heart to that wisdom that's already in the cells of your body, because, you know, as, as Zach Bush, as whom we love as well, says, we are the microbiome, that mm. knowledge, that intelligence comes out of you and through you if you allow it. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, we've been deliberately programmed as a species and separated from mother nature and all of that knowing um as those custodians which you talk about too scott which is what i love so all that all that that uh, you know all the juice which is what you were absorbing in that food um matilda obviously the, the information coming from that animal and obviously being vegan and vegetarian in the past myself too you guys know full well that wh whatever the the conscious state of an animal is when they're killed that energetic goes into their physical energetic body and then you ingest that so that to me explains why so many people eating fast food and crappy meats and vegetables and things full of god knows what are also cranky crappy unhealthy humans but they don't realize that they're they're absorbing the field of the animal and the trauma that that animal experienced either through its life or through its death i know that's a bit of a huge spiritual sort of thing to talk about but that's um that's where I come from anyway, <laughs> from the countryside of things too. Does that resonate with you guys? There's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean the, the regeneration stuff, um for for sure. I mean, um our our farm up north, um, which my parents bought 40 years ago, uh, it's been in our in my life and my siblings' life for, forever. Um that was a conventionally farmed farm um, uh, for up until about seven years ago, I'd say, when when mum started to hear of this term regen or regenerative regenerative farming. Um, and so we we've we've um, we I didn't really take much notice, and neither did she, of how the farm was being farmed before um, before she started to to talk about regen a lot <laughs> and then it became everything she talked about um but yeah I think like you know as a kid you're I mean for me we were just we were we were just playing you know that it was just open space you know um back of the ute uh swimming in the dam going to the beach we, it's right near Scott's head so um there's a great surf beach right near there um you know it's it's not you're not I certainly wasn't, I won't speak for all kids, but I certainly wasn't concerned with how the farm was being farmed or whether we were using chemicals or fertilizers or whatever. Um, and, and neither was mum and or dad because it was a, it was, you know, it was a hobby farm. It was a, it was a place we went to in the holidays. It was managed by a farm manager. Mum's not a farmer. Um, you know, so I think when you're, when it's not your, Thing that you're doing every day and you're not educating yourself on that you probably aren't aware of it um and then mum became aware of it and she started you know like it was all she talked about it was all she read and um our farm manager mick um took over the running of the farm from his dad mm -hmm. so you know isn't he he's um his dad is very old school and um and they you know, and that, that's been quite a contentious thing for them is that his new way of farming mm -hmm. and he was right into regen. So him and mum together turned the farm, have been regenerating the farm for the last seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when, and, you know, and we've been, we've been hearing about it and learning about it and on kind of the regen journey as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, and yes, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Like when you start to understand, um, you know, I guess like the power of healthy soil, which is mm. something that you just don't can can pass by so easily. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. 
And it's interesting that uh, that your mum had started that because or become interested in that. I'm not saying that your dad wasn't interested as well, but you mentioned your mum suddenly became aware of regenerative farming. Um, do you know what, did someone come and talk to her about it or did she just see it on, on the, the news or online or something? Like what was her... her uh, mate, sort of mate. I think... I think I, it was Mick. Yeah. It was Mick, the farmer. Okay. Yeah, he came to her and said, I want to, I'd like to farm, do this farm regenerative, regeneratively. Mm-hmm. And mum was like, what's that? And then he started to talk to her about it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and it took it took dad a while to get him on board because you certainly don't you lose money when you start regenerating your land. Um, and you know, the idea is that in in the long run you you make more money because you're not there's less way less inputs. But yeah, land has to recover. And that's really that that's like an addict. It's like taking yeah. drugs away from an addict. Like you you can't just take them away. <laughs> yep serious withdrawals that happen and they have to their body has to relearn the soil has to relearn how to work how to yep. do the work and the and the microorganisms have to come back and the dung beetles have to come back and that yep. is a really big process yeah um, and mum just made a film about it basically about her um regenerating the 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 land if anyone's interested it's called rachel's farm and it's coming out soon <laughs> <laughs> I was seeing that on on the website as well, and I've been checking out Little Farm too, which I'm just going to invite myself to come up and stay there <laughs> because it looks fantastic, and yeah. I'd love to talk to her about the the doco because that's 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 absolutely brilliant. And um, I've always thought that this is a side note as well um, that your mum and your dad would have been the actual perfect choice for the film Australia, even more so than the two lead actors that were chosen for that. Um, and it's, so it's lovely that she, because they're on the land and they're living like that as well. So that's just my own little personal opinion in there anyway. <laughs> and I think also like, like Mick was the impetus, but there's a, there's a lot, there's a big part of Rachel that um, she loves nature, right? So she's, she's at her best, I think, when she's at the farm. Or you know she spent a chunk there and she comes back. She she almost like re, she rejuvenates herself being mm-hmm. at the farm, being at nature. So I think you know it probably came at a time in her life where she wanted to spend more and more time on the farm, out of the city. Yep. Um, and then so that collided with Mick saying, "Oh, mm-hmm. you know, let let's um let's think about how we manage this property." Yeah, yeah. It was pretty ballsy for Mick because what it meant for Mick was that. He's sort of going, you know, it's a small community up there. There's lots of other farmers and mm-hmm. they're all doing it the way that they've been doing it for generations, mm-hmm. like his dad. And so he had all this, all his peers, as well as his dad saying, it won't work, mate. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like, so it actually caused a bit of a, a fraction between um, his dad and, and, and yep. yeah. Uh, and so but he's very passionate about it. He's you very know. passionate about it. He's well read. He's well versed in it and he's seeing it come to you know he's seeing the 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 magnitude of the effect that it can have mm. um so it it is it is creating positive change in the soil and the 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 ability for the soil to you know hold water which is you know essential in a country like ours mm. um but yeah I, my hat goes off to me because he's it's a it was a ballsy move in a small community to fly in the face of convention basically Mm, mm. brought Rachel along Rachel was just like well well yeah and Rachel's been a, a lover of nature all her life I'd say um certainly for the time that I've known her and so I would say it sort of plugged directly into her values you know let's just allow nature to do what nature does best mm. you know of course let's yeah if there's a way that we don't use pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers then yes th- that would all make sense in her in her mind you know with that sort of stuff so that that became the genesis of this journey for Rachel um which is eventually sort of um led to her her documentary in a in a documentary in a film which is you know as I said out out later this year no that's that's great and that makes total sense and it's it's like um we're all especially with what's been going on the last couple of years too like three or four years it's about leaving a legacy isn't it, you know, to teaching our children, which a lot of young kids don't even know where the food comes from in the supermarket and they wouldn't know the difference between different types of foods or 
and yeah. know what the ingredients are and what the additives and things like that are and the connections to you know things like allergies and the hyperactivity and being on the spectrum and all those things can be traced back to in my opinion and through my own research a lot of not just injectables that we're given as children but also the things that we put into our bodies <laughs> the things yeah. that we breathe in the water that we drink the quality yeah. of the water etc and and then of course our connection again to land you now to oh. the, being the 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 indigenous quality that, that, that each one of us embodies as well um for anyone listening just um either both of you or either of you a quick description of what regenerative farming is versus the conventional way because a lot of people might not actually understand i mean they're getting an idea of what regen is and more natural but then you know, when you mention the words like monoculture and things like that scott some people might not actually be familiar with those terms can you give us a, just a brief um comparison um actually till gives a pretty good description but <laughs> I'll, I'll maybe start um, I guess a crude, crude explanation might be that there's an industrialized or conventional, you know, I, I'm not even sure what the, you know, we keep saying conventional, but, you know, how far does conventional go back? If you trace conventional back, it, it's actually regen, you know, like, mm. so I guess there's an industrialized version of farming and there's regenerative and under the banner of regen, there's holistic land management there's biodynamics, um, it's sustainable farming, basically. So there's a few different sort of methodologies, but essentially under the re regen banner, it's about giving back to the land. So you're not just through, as you are through the industrialized farm um, farming method, you're just extracting the nutrients from the soil. Mm. So obviously that, that has a shelf life and we're seeing the sort of, you know, there's, there's different reports about how many years of, of topsoil we've got left of, you know, workable topsoil, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere between 40 and 60. So clearly the industrialized version of farming is one that's not sustainable. We're getting to the end of that shelf life. Mm -hmm. and so the regen is sort of the antithesis of that, whereby you manage your land and you manage mm -hmm. the cattle quite importantly, the cattle, the cattle becomes a, a tool, if you'd like, mm. to ensure that the the grass is kept to a vegetative state, meaning that it's in optimal photosynthesis, meaning that you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and you're using some of that carbon to regrow the grass, but you're also using some of that carbon to lock it into the soil mm. and, and trade with microbes and fungi and all the rest of it. Yep. So it you know one uses one has to use chemical intervention in the form of herbicides fertilizers and and um pesticides, pesticides because you're constantly depleting the soil and you want to and and because you're using often monoculture you know you you're devoting huge um, paddocks to one single species and that isn't emulated in in nature so you're going to have to um, keep pests at bay and mm. unwanted plants at bay and so you're going to naturally have to use chemical intervention yeah the antithesis regen allows multiple species whether that's animals and plants to coexist and that's more akin to how nature is mm. So what one, you know, regen, I think maybe Till mentioned it earlier, sort of, or maybe that was on another podcast, but it's often the term, the lazy farmer or the lazy farming, because you kind of take your foot off to a degree, right? So yes, you've got to move your cattle daily or maybe more than once a day, depending on what season you're in. But you know, if a tree falls down or you, you know, it's, it's might not be the end of the world. You might not have to attend to it because that becomes potentially habitat for, you know, ground mm -hmm. nesting birds or other plant species that sort of help to increase biodiversity and microorganisms that eventually help the soil and, and, you know, the, the cycle goes on. So, you know, you leave borders untouched. You, you allow for, um, it's a much scruffier, it's a Looking, much scruffier. Yeah, it yeah. might not look as pretty, but it's everything's got a function and everything's got a relationship. There's the wisdom of everything interacting. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the moment you try and compartmentalize uh, a plant or a, a farm or a crop, 
or an animal, like you're going to run into hazards, right? You're going to run into something that's going to fly in the face of that. And that's when you have to have all these inputs to combat that. Mm. But I, so I guess, yeah, the regen is, is just allowing nature to do what nature does best. And yes, it is a bit of a, a lazy form, but ultimately well, it's, it's it's actually i mean like i think lazy is an unfair term yeah it I don't probably think, is i don't think there's any farmer out there who would I'm be like they're going we're not lazy we work from i'm lazy <laughs> yeah and they're working their asses off regardless <laughs> what type of farming they're doing but i, I think the, the the point of it is like once it's regenerating like we've all seen nature like take over once it's regenerating and the soil is working and it's healthy it's like you know it, it's it just it it goes to work itself you don't have to put chemicals into the ground to grow the grass. The grass will grow. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so in, in that way, but but with the sort of the messy type of like regen farming is it's one of the things that my mum struggled with because she's such an aesthetic person. Like she she loves things to be beautiful. Like she loves the farm looking just beautiful. And, um, you know, urea is one of the things that you put onto grass to, to make it like green and and to make it grow and to make it look beautiful and it's one of the things that you don't put on a regen farm and it's like you know you we drive around the the um the hillsides at, when we're at the farm and pointing out that's a regen farm that's that's not a regen farm because you see the tufts you see the you know nature in all its forms coming through it's not a beautiful you know mm-hmm. You're used to pointing out, oh my God, look at that beautiful paddock over there. It's so lush and green, but actually underneath the soil, it's not lush. You know, it's not thriving. It's the ones that actually look kind of tufty and um, unconventional (laughs) that are the ones that are probably thriving. And it's kind of like um, when you say that, Matilda, it's like learning to get out of the way of Mother Nature because for so long humans have thought that we know better than Mother Nature. A newsflash, we don't. You know, <laughs> we, we are made of the same elements of yeah. nature, obviously, yeah. and on this planet. Um, yeah. And that wisdom can run through us as a con, you know, if we can allow ourselves to be a conduit. But yeah, this thing, and you, you write about in the book, I know, Scott, and also the other podcasts that I've watched you talk about it too is about how we've got this obsession and we've all been conditioned to need to have our meat look a certain way. It's got to have a certain amount of marbling or it's got to be this shape or, you know, the vegetables. We know when we go to the organic markets down here in Warriwood too, the organic stuff doesn't look as great, but you know it's full of goodness. And um, it's just a a changing of your mind pattern, isn't it, really? I mean, how do you... How do you um, sort of explain that to not just your clients and, and people that buy your produce as well, but, I mean, I'm thinking of... How do we change that dialogue for Aussie farmers? Because the farmers that I know and that I grew up with and that you guys know as well are salt of the earth people and they've got the best of intentions and they're all about community and mateship and all those things. They're like hearts of gold. But they've quite, and a lot of them have had their farms for generation after generation. These practices have been handed down and they may not necessarily be you know, the best ones for now with, you know, what we're working with, with the planet, et cetera. So how do you, um, how do you, first of all, there's two parts to that question about, you know, changing people's perception about what looks nice and if it's going to be okay to eat. And then also how do you start to have that dialogue with the farmers to help educate them to move from the conventional to the more regen? Yeah, I, I think in a, in a rush for, you know, to maximize, you know, let's think about this in terms of the last hundred years in this, you know, we've, in the last hundred years, we've, we've, you know, become highly mechanized. We've become highly industrialized. A lot of our animals have become, and plants become commodities. And we've, we've got to a point now in 2023 that we've kind of boxed ourselves into this odd corner that yes, we are in this incredibly privileged time that you and I can go walk into any supermarket pretty much anywhere around around the country and you know there's always something on the shelves you know we we, this is a a privileged time to be able to shop indiscriminately for anything in our basket or trolley but somewhere in that highly commoditized industrialized methodology we've created this paradigm where and i'm not sure what came first whether it's top down or bottom up but as you say there's an expectation that our ribeye has to look a certain way 
So there's pressure from consumers. Well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure which which way, which, you know, whether it's the the growers that sort of forced our hand and led the expectation or whether it's the other way and a bit of both. But basically, it's become a science to grow cattle um, their end of life. A lot of cows and their end of life is spent in a feedlot. You know, by and large, it's about 50 to 90 days, but it can be, you know, in excess of a year, depending on breed and what the starting weight. But basically, it's become this science that enables a, a, a an animal to be slaughtered at the optimal weight with optimal, optimal fat, fat coverage, fat marbling, because we are shopping in the supermarket aisle and we're picking up that ribeye and we want it to look a certain color. We want it to have a certain amount of fat coverage and a certain amount of um, marbling fat, fat through the, through the muscle. Yeah. Um, but basically in that process, what we're creating are sick animals really, if you want to go down that path, because that end of life, a, they're not spending on, on the paddock with lush pastures underneath their hooves. They're not eating what they should be eating. They're eating this sort of amalgam of millet and corn and maize and wheat, which, you know, they're not eating in nature. And they're sort of, um, so it's it's highly monitored and highly sort of regulated. So by the time it meets its, you know, has its final day, it's it's, stakes are going to look the way that we want it to look yeah. so how do we undo that that's a really good question um i guess it needs to be a concerted effort or there needs to be choice right so if that's the only thing that's going to be on the supermarket shelves because i'm just kind of i haven't thought this through so i'm sort of spitballing as i'm going so how does this change well if that's the only choice we have it's not going to change but if you put something that's um, more holistically managed next to it mm. it's going to have a different color different fat marbling you know pound for pound it's going to look different mm. but through education if on that package it's got grass finished or mm. holistically managed or you know, any of those sort of terms that we're sort of becoming more and more familiar with, then then and only then does the consumer have the opportunity to compare and potentially move towards a sort of non-conventional product. Yeah. Or sorry, yeah. non-conventionally farmed product. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I didn't mind to put you on the spot there. It's a big early. topic and something that we should we should all you know be thinking of because it's a conversation definitely to have and, and expand upon and it's rather than being just profit money driven, it's about being consciously driven and, and educating people. And when you were saying that, Scott, and great great suggestions too. Um, back in 2000, I think it was 2015, yeah, um, I've always supported Sea Shepherd. I've been probably like yourselves as well, just cannot deal with the whale slaughter or anything like that and dolphins in Japan and all that sort of stuff just made me literally physically ill. So yeah. I decided to start running yoga retreats to Tonga to swim with the whales because I'd always wanted to do that myself. And it was like, okay, well, if people, um, and this might be part of the solution conversation that, we, that I've sort of opened up here as well, um, to get people to connect. When people got in the water with the whales and they had the most incredible heart opening experiences, I mean, now you're trying to breathe with a snorkel on your face and you're crying and it's just like you're exploding with love and these beings are like coming up to you, you can touch them almost. Every single person would come home changed. One of them actually started her own eco-friendly, not, not using plastic business, and she's going great guns now six years later. Everybody else was like, right, I'm no longer going to be supporting this product or that product. It just shifted something because they were in nature, seeing firsthand for themselves the, the, the consequences of their choices, as you're saying, that they can make every day we go into the supermarket. We've got heaps of choices, but what do I actually really need? Not what I want all the time, but what's best on 
several different layers. So maybe, I mean, that's why I love what I see what you're doing on your farm. As I say, little farm as well. You're having tours for people that are staying there that can go and learn about this stuff. Well, I mean, if, if people want to have a regen tour with Mick, then they can have a regen tour with Mick, and they can go out and see how he see how he manages the land. And he, I mean, he's. They, everyone falls in love with Mick when they go there because he's such a legend. He's just well, like, I'm, yeah, I want to have a tour with Mick for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, something like that, expanding um, that and starting some sort of initiative for other farmers. So you maybe you go and you educate the farmers themselves first and then you go, right, hey, let's put an Airbnb here. A bit of extra money. It's not going to hurt anybody. And mm. then you can also help educate. I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff mm. out there like you are, mm. but some, something. Well, I mean, in, this, in this time, going yeah. back to this sort of privileged time that we're, we're in, that... <clears throat> Yes, we can walk down any supermarket aisle and everything's beautifully presented and available to us. It's because of that that I think you mentioned it earlier, Demi, that our kids have a disconnection with where our food has come from and it's no fault of their own, right? So they just pop down to Woolies or Coles or whatever it may be and they're able to grab a, a piece of, you know, a, a, a side of salmon or a fillet of fish or, a, you know, with with no sort of understanding of of the conceptual, you know, what it took for that thing to get mm. onto that supermarket aisle, or, you know, onto that supermarket shelf. Like, um, you know, I remember Jamie Oliver watching a documentary on him and and he went into school. It was when he was doing that school program. Oh, right. yep. And asking those kids in that classroom, you know, this is probably 10 years ago, you know, where does x come from or where and the, <laughs> the kids are just bamboozled like and it's no fault of their own like you know you got to feel sorry for for the predicament we've all got ourselves into in this bid to to get yields and commoditize everything we've sort of disconnected from land and we've disconnected from nature mm. you know i guess the time is now not to finger point anymore it's okay well what can we all do and how do we raise awareness for these other mm. options that are available to us because like you were saying like your your family it, this isn't nothing this is nothing new right so your family raised their land or you know tended to their property um without chemicals people have been doing this for eons it's how agriculture started mm. so it's nothing new it's probably more akin to, you know it's probably more in tune with our dna than certainly the industrialized version so we just need to we're just we happen to exist in a time that we've got to this grotesque form of farming where you know if you've watched those documentaries that till mentioned earlier like you know nobody wants nobody's an advocate for that you know so we, we just happen to be in this time where that's the predominant force and now we need to kind of open our eyes and ears and understand what else is available and sort of, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight, these changes. It's a it's a slow moving beast. But you know, unfortunately the 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 um <clears throat> con, you know the conventional way um is also the 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 cheapest way for people to get a stake on their plate. So um you know you for a lot of people it's the only it is the only option mm. um if they want to eat meat or have you know a, a dinner for their family on a budget um I think that's like you know it's a it's a when when we were we're not I don't know if you know but we're not actually doing the cow the meat boxes anymore we, we we're only doing the ready meals now but um when we were doing those it was you know it really got to a point it was so expensive it's so expensive to get whole animals off a farm um, you know, when we, when we were like, when, when we had our moment of like, oh God, wouldn't it be great to, to be eating this, these cows from this farm that are raised this way, you know, holistically, um, you know, with holistic farming, um, oh my gosh, to get, to get a cow. I mean, if, they, if people had to go through the process logistically of getting their steak on a plate from the paddock, they'd really learn about how hard it is what you have to you know what something someone or something goes through to get that on the supermarket aisle because it is it is it's huge um all the health regulations and all the boxes that you need to tick as well to make sure you don't kill someone if you pick yeah, someone. i mean even just like freight even just like okay cool we need someone we need like someone to get to that farm to take that cow 
to that butcher, uh, to that abattoir, to that butcher, um, to us in a coal, you know, coal chain. To there's just there's so much that it takes. And no wonder but butchers don't buy whole animals anymore. They buy crates of cuts from abattoirs that come from a whole lot of different farms and a whole lot of different feedlots. It just is. It, the, the consumer has really gotten to the point where cheap food is what they expect. I can have this at this price. Mm. And that is, you know, that that does help to feed the masses, but we've also gotten to such a point where we are so, we so expect something to be cheap and mm. food shouldn't, shouldn't be cheap. Like it shouldn't be this cheap because it does come at a cost when it's that cheap, um, you know, and then, you know, and then you have people, you know, you have real food <laughs> or like, you know, food that doesn't, that, 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 that kind of like, I guess is the food that we used to grow and our, and our nonas used to make. And it's, it's more expensive than the average, mm. you know, yeah. thing from your supermarket or whatever. And so then, and then people are annoyed about it. <laughs> And they're angry with you for charging that much. And you're like, this is what ingredients cost when they don't go through the, the highly industrialised system. Isn't it funny, though, when you say that, Matilda? I mean, it's so crazy, especially in our beautiful area, as wonderful as it is, too. It's very affluent. So there's a lot of people that you'll see walking around in, you know, Couture, quite literally. And and this probably feeds into another conversation, which we won't go anywhere near, of course, about, you know, the, the, the psycho-spiritual aspects and the way that we're happy to put things on top of ourselves and mask ourselves and clothe ourselves in certain, certain things to look a particular way. But when it comes to really nurturing and nourishing the inner person, the actual soul, our body, the vehicle or our temple, um, we, we scrimp and save. So we'll spend hundreds of dollars on looking like we've got our shit together, but inside we're not going to go and spend something a little bit extra five, 10 bucks on something to make sure that our gut keeps working properly. It's it's interesting. Yeah. Humans are funny creatures, man. We yeah. really are. You know? food, food particularly, I'd say people get this. There's, there's a, you know, sort of like the expectation that there shouldn't be, it should all be a certain amount, you know, when you, or if you go into an organic store and you're like, oh my God, this is daylight robbery. I can't believe they're charging that much for, you know, maybe you'd never walk into Louis Vuitton and say that. You'd be like, <laughs> I expect it to be two five thousand dollars. <laughs> no, but you, you you brought up a, a good point. So I I just went on a bit of a rant about I know um you know a steak looking a certain way that's come through the the industrialized version. Yep. And yes, Till's point it is is cheaper and budget is really important, right? So I just want to sort of yes, it is. But put a caveat in there that if you know i'm not suggesting for one moment that if you can't afford the organic version of meat or the regen version of meat then don't eat meat you know putting my nutritionist hat on i'd prefer that you eat meat than than not can i say that um, <laughs> you're not a bad person if you don't buy expensive meat okay full yeah, um, yeah I, I don't want this to come across yeah. like a you know like a um an elitist kind of diatribe you know like that that's not that's not my intention at all but i am aware of simple economics and 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 going back to those choices if there is another choice on that shelf for that customer mm -hmm. this choice is a bit greener and a bit more eco and a bit more high in animal welfare standards mm -hmm. if enough people are purchasing this product B, let's call it, you know, supply and demand is such that the yep. more people that, you know, the price comes down and then we've got a more competitive yep. price point, you know, and that, and that's, look, we've been operating in this space for, you know, I, I've been talking about this stuff that, you know, I talked about it in my first book in 2013, like, um, but we've been, you know, um, at the coal face of this stuff for the last 18 months. And so there's, we know a lot of other businesses in this space and we lo know a lot of producers and farmers and proponents of this type of agriculture. And at times it feels a bit niche. It feels like we're all talking to each other, <laughs> but it's starting to bleed out into mm. um, a more general population. And and that's when you get this tipping point, right? You get this, mm. this um, kick in the curve that, you know, 
it sort of becomes a bit exponential but we're not we're not there yet but it's it's happening you know you go to harris farm um and they've got a section dedicated to regen so you can get you know regen meat you can get wine you can get um uh, biodynamic this and that um you know that didn't happen that wasn't there 18 months ago yeah. mm. who's to say that Coles or Woolies or IGA won't follow suit in in time to come and that's when we start to build awareness and that's when we have choice and if there's choice you know perhaps the people that the early adopters bring the price down for, mm. for the late comers yeah no good point Scott because and you're right we don't want to be excluding people it's not about widening the gap between socioeconomic and what people can afford, et cetera, because a lot yeah. of people, that's the reality, people are struggling as well. I'm certainly not, you know, in either of those camps. I'm sort of somewhere in the middle, but it's 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 a challenge for all of us. And it's um, it certainly, I mean, I did an interview with Helena Norberg Hodge a couple of months ago, you know, talking about globalisation versus localization. And so I mean, even if you want to sort of just go, well, a reason why a lot of people don't feel like they can, A, or don't even know about the different choices, what we're talking about of, of non-organic options versus what they're seeing in the supermarket. Um, and they don't know about the beast that is globalization, which is all that monoculture and conventional farming and that that literally that machine that is trying to take over the planet and you know, the Bill Gates of the world buying up all the farmland, et cetera, and all those other stories, then it's it's you no, know, it will take it's it's a grassroots uh, situation where it just takes those of us who are, as you said, already aware to just keep holding that line and keep educating people. And then eventually um, more people, which is already happening, as you say, uh, the yeah. market's down in Warriwood gets fuller and fuller each week. I notice that myself and, and other places all around this country too, as well as the world. I'm sure that's happening. More people are sort of, you know, waking up, becoming aware about what's going on in the world and what they're, what they're contributing to and how they're feeding themselves. So, yeah. you know, it's localization is it's hard to extricate ourselves from that beast machine because all of us have been programmed to it without even realizing that we have so it's once you wake up to that and you start to move yourself away from that um and this is why it's an individuated experience as you guys have discovered certainly with starting your, you know the good farm shop is that it's <laughs> matter about what else is going on around you what feels right to you and what sort of legacy we mentioned earlier in this podcast that you want to leave like your mum and your dad are doing on the farm that's the most important thing and then people will resonate with that that creates an energy that people just sense and feel and they mm -hmm. get drawn to and then they'll, they'll just cross your path fortuitously or someone will say oh I know if you know Scott and Till they're doing this or they'll go to their house have one of those dinner parties where one person who never goes to a party turns up <laughs> just taking a risk and they have one of your meals or something like that and then it, it shifts something in their dynamic so yeah. it's baby steps out yeah. of that big system mm. yeah everyone becomes an advocate yeah you know? you know their their volume might be loud or or quiet but they're they're an advocate whether yep. they do it passively or aggressively, yep. and, you know, they by nature we rub up against one another. We we have to, and so in conversations or eating a certain way, like you influence someone, mm. you know, you can influence someone positive or negatively. Yeah, but <laughs> hopefully, what we're talking about is eating a certain way, buying from, yep. you know, supporting a certain agricultural methodology. That mm. that's by virtue of doing that and adhering to that, you can potentially influence someone else. Yeah. And that's how it sort of gains momentum and stuff. And I think too, when you when you guys are sharing what you are, that's it's the under the undercurrent of all this is like to me the story of food is its connection, its empowerment, its education, its family, its legacy. It's you know that you say it in yourself, you know, the custodian of your own health. It's all those, you know, we come together to break bread and we, you know, we we teach the the little ones get taught by the elders and the stories around the campfire or the dinner table or you know, whatever's going on there. And 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 people coming together with their own um offerings and bringing their own plate and different foods and different cultures of different foods coming together. That's that's the lost art of cooking that I know you would definitely relate to Scott in the the experience that you've had and what and, and certainly your upbringing as well with the publican food and your mum which I'm sure you're putting all of that I mean that's not just owning a pub that's like heart and soul sort of stuff isn't yeah. it you know all stuff absorbed os through osmosis you know that's seeing hearing smelling getting your hands dirty like you know I, mm. I, I'm cooking what my mum used to cook mm. 
for the customers you know fast forward 30 yeah. you know it's 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 quite remarkable like because yeah. yeah. i know that those are the foods that you know I, I guess there's two you know as a just as a human they nourished me as a kid and as an adolescent and they're the smells that i'm very familiar with mm. also from a new you know a, a a functioning human they're the foods that nourish me as well so there's an emotional and a physical thing happening but you're you're right like it it's in our dna to break bread together to sit at a table or around a fire um and we've to some degree i know this site might sound counterintuitive because till and i have a, a ready meals business but um the art of cooking is is not to be um understated like we it's the greatest gift you can give someone to cook for them from scratch you know not i'm not talking about heating up like a good farm shop ready meal no I'm not, <laughs> no i'm not talking about you know you rip, do that ripping open a packet of you know whatever you know fill in the next place. best thing till okay <laughs> now i'm dig, digging my own grave here but um, <laughs> you know what i mean like there, there's something that you no, you're a bridge, Scott, because you're making the food with love and all the good stuff in yeah. it, and with all the, you know, all the, all the information and everything in that. Yeah, and more, <laughs> and you're packaging up. For, you're doing it beautifully with, and you're following through, which is something I wanted to mention too, because there's so many eco businesses that I see, and I know I'll order, you know, like a, an eco-friendly necklace or you know, an oil for my, you know, my products that I make, and and it comes in bloody bubble wrap or something like that. So yeah. it, it's got to be follow through, continuity through everything, and you guys are doing that with your packaging and everything. So you're like a bridge for those people who either don't have time. Just go, yeah. like I used to, oh, like I can't cook, it's too hard, I hate it, they've got some sort of trauma story there, whatever, and yeah. at least they're eating something good that they have to heat up. And then eventually they'll, like the addict will become more self-nurturing and they'll be able to go, oh, I can do it myself now. Yeah. But, you know, you're an important bridge, I think, in and especially in this fast food culture that we live in and where, you know, we all grew, we've been lucky like yourself, Till, as well on the farm when we were younger. We've had those, like, I was skateboarding until dusk when I was a kid and playing out in the garden and our mm. children now, they're on devices and they're being bombarded by Wi-Fi and 5G and all this crazy stuff and social media. So they're kind of like, you know, they're, they're victims of the times, really. Everything's relative. So it's a lot harder to kind of sort of knock through, you know, that shell and get back and get them to reconnect with what they've been so distanced from, which is the same knowing in their body and their cells. They just don't know it yet. But also like, um, let, let's say we're talking about an individual who, you know, dabbles in fast food and maybe doesn't exercise and, um, you know, buys from those high street supermarkets, you know, it's sort of, you know, maybe probably someone fairly typical, right, in terms of their um, unconscious buying, let's say, and then they want to make change. Like that, the the threat that that has to be perfect 100% of the time is, you know, nobody's perfect. You don't have to get it right all the time. But I think if somebody, whoever that person is, is making, you know, they're looking, their trajectory is up, right, and they're, they're, thinking about their next best move mm. but it doesn't have to be that you're eating you know organic kale and mm. ribeyes for breakfast and something yes. equally delicious and eco for lunch and dinner and and, and yep. so and you know exercising in the right way and drinking lots of water just just think about what your current position is and maybe if there's an upward trajectory in terms of you know and all in all the facets of of your life you know like mm. uh, we, we've been talking about food and provenance of food but there's also you know connection and um you know self-awareness and work and family like there's lots of different silos of our life yeah. um, and we all have an opportunity at every junction in 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 our life and every junction in our day to kind of you know, do we stay the same or do we elevate somewhat? And that degree of elevation can only be, mm. might only be slight, but over the course of weeks, months, years, decades, it's it amplifies, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's about you know, being, growing into the better version of ourselves, really. And um, 
that's you know thank you dr zach because that's exactly the, what zach <laughs> would say you know we, we there's a great opportunity here yes we can look at the doom and the gloom and all the crazy shit that's going on which it is that's all happening there's like you no know, bifurcation of timelines and certain consciousnesses that are going in opposite ways that's all fine Everyone's going to do what they're going to do, but we still have this brilliant opportunity if we see it through that lens of recognizing, like I said it before, we are the microbiome, you know, we are the soil, the men and women of the living soil of this planet. And we have an opportunity now to you know, make even just the smallest changes in our own home environments. And then again, that has a ripple effect. And then who knows? I mean, I always have, I always jokingly say that, you know, whatever happens on the with all the stuff that's going on in the world, as long as I leave with less baggage than what I came in with, then that's a bonus, you know. So even if we you know we leave some sort of you know footprint or legacy in a positive way for our children and our children's children, um, and you know, we either survive through what's coming or we don't, it's not really about that. It's about the giving back aspect and having the discipline to do that. So I think those things have been um, you know, quite honestly bred out of the human genome for quite a while and a lot of people aren't even aware that they're not aware of that you know and yeah. and as you as you have with all your initiatives and we'll, I mean let's talk about the good shop um the good farm shop sorry or the good farm dot shop I should say so you've got it's just the two of you you're in the kitchen Scott cooking Matilda I'm sure you're cooking and preparing or not or what's the story there I, I'm going to go get Zan because I got to go to pick him up from daycare so I'll, I'll leave Scott to awesome darling Chat. Nice to talk to you, Denby, and yeah. thank, thanks to all the listeners. All right. <clears throat> See so ya. Do you come back here or go and get a look? Oh, oh. <laughs> just, just me. Just you. Okay, cool. Carry on. <laughs> so you're doing the cooking? You're cooking at yeah. home and then shipping it there, or are you doing it in the warehouse, or what's the setup? No, we've got a, we've got a commercial kitchen in Brookvale. Mm -hmm. So I'm there... Um, probably five times a week and we do do batch cooks of whatever it is that we're sort of getting low on whether that's you know I guess we should sort of mention that we're not we've been around for about a year and a half but we pivoted about January and sort of launched around early Feb so we're, we're only sort of 60 days old really as a standalone ready meal business yeah. so we've got I don't know maybe 30 skews from from sauces to dressings to to meals but meals make up the bulk of that offering um, and so going back to what I was saying about cooking the things that are reminiscent for me like I'm doing chili con carne steak and kidney pie beef stroganoff all those sort of mm. to my mind hearty familiar comforting food but without any of the the guilt associated with potentially like yep, yep. comfort food soul food yeah soul food yeah um and i guess those dishes have been around for eons for a reason you know they're um they're not novel foods novel foods to me are you know new and experimental and potentially with more um new ingredients that aren't necessarily health promoting but if you think about traditional foods, yeah. like you say, it's all meat and three veg or, you know, a connotation of that, those, those sort of ingredients. So, And disguising you know. a lot of things too. Like if people overcook something, then they'll shove a whole lot of condiments onto it to try and disguise that yeah. they've completely killed the food. Whereas I, I, what I understand from your book as well is that you say use meat as the condiment and like what's that sort of concept? Yeah, whether whether I whether I adhere to that today. So I wrote that book in 2019. Okay. I wrote it in 18, it came out in 2019. And I guess what I mean by that is um I, I guess I was coming at it from a, a perspective that we eat too much meat. And I guess maybe if you dissect that a, a layer deeper, that there's too much meat being consumed from from feedlots, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, use meat as a condiment. I, I, I guess there was, I guess one motivation there is to sort of force people or encourage people, I should say, not force, to have more veggies on their plates. You know, like veg, veggies are the hero. Mm. 
they sort of reframe how we have, you know, in Australia, for example, we're very much a barbecue culture and, you know, you get your, your, your pork or your sausage or your, or your T-bone and that occupies most of the plate and then your veggies and the, and the salad get a bit of a, a raw deal. Because, because the literature sort of dictates that, you know, a lot of us are having um, too fewer veggies. And so maybe just flipping that, um, how we model our plate a bit differently. So all of a sudden the meat and the, or the, sorry, the, the veggies and the salad are now the hero. Yep. Yes, always have protein. I'm not suggesting for one moment that a condiment is a bit of a um, uh, negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. So maybe maybe that's the wrong choice. Um, as I said, you know, that's been four years since that book came out. And so I feel like I've sort of evolved a little bit in this in this in this department. So it's interesting that you brought it up actually. It's like whether I would write in those terms now, like meat is the condiment, I would sort of ref I would sort of my my the subtext there is encouraging people to eat more veggies. Mm, yep. So rather than the meat be the hero, let's let's hero the veggies. Yeah, and have more balance, as you say. I mean, yeah. the, the Ayurvedic way of cooking and, and also the macro type of way, which I as I mentioned before, went, went from anal to being less anal now, is have a little bit of each season represented, each of the different flavours on your plate with each meal that you have sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, that depends as well if you go into body types and doshes and all those things, which, you know, you would with your expertise in nutrition and different types of personalities and body types and constitutions and things too. Yeah. Well, that's the thing you can't i think there's one thing it's one thing to prescribe a good diet right you could say you could look at someone's diet and then and their food diary and say okay well here here are the wins here is where we can modify here's where we could sort of amplify your health and your mood and 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 on on paper that that sounds very easy right As, assuming that you've factored in their diet uh, sorry, it factored in their budget and their accessibility of food and all that. But what layers over the top of that is is your psychology and your uh, emotional attachment to food and your behavior um, behavior around food and your past grief and trauma. Like it's all like this. You know, you can't you can't pull one away from the other. Mm -hmm. so what you know, what I often find is that my clients get a lot of success in those early days because they're because we can all modify our diet um for you know seven 14 days quite a lot you know you can you can moderate moderate it uh, modify it quite substantially early on right and then it becomes harder because all these sort of old proclivities to certain foods and uh, all that behavioral stuff starts to come back in and it's yep. that that you've got to double down and you've got to combat that stuff away yep. Yep. so th the idea is that you you look at their diet and you look at their food diary and then you create change in the smallest amount and the less um, disruptive way possible mm -hmm. and so it almost becomes seamless if you like you make these small adaptations that are attainable and practical and accessible and affordable and you do that enough times that it becomes inherent to that person um but that i mean that's the you know if it was as easy for us all just to follow you know an optimal diet because we all kind of know what that roughly is right there's you know there's minutia there's there's nuances between dietitians and nutritionists and all that stuff but by and large we can say you know, a diet rich in in a, uh, a plenitude of vegetables and uh, and good meat and some equal fat, like all that stuff. Um, not not the traditional, um, not the traditional. What do you call it? Uh, pyramid, <laughs> definitely. Uh, <that> one. <laughs> you, you've got to you've got to factor in all that psychological stuff. That's the 
that's yeah, well, where training personalities really aren't you above about yeah. anything else and and, uh, and addictions or attachments really and then you got to yeah. tailor that to the person yeah we all have that on on a you know it's all on a spectrum but we all yeah. yeah we all um you know are, are victims of some degree or not of comfort eating or we have that one thing that we can't do without yeah. uh, you know i've got a friend who religious real, you know he's a grown man he's my age he's you know late 40s and he has uh i won't name him but he has cookie cookies and milk yep. every night without fail and that's you know clearly something that he did as a mm. a young bloke you know three or four year old and and now he's you know 40 years older well, as long as he's uh, not eating nappies at the same time scott it's okay <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's his own business <laughs> okay. Uh, right. okay no comment <laughs> oh yeah there, there's a lot I mean that's a whole other conversation and podcast all together but it's it's uh as you say I mean I'm sure that you have lots of different people coming to you for a variety of things you know uh, treatment or support for cancer for example or heavy metal detoxes or diabetes I mean do you do you have one sort of you know ailment or thing like that that you find is um getting really prevalent now um yeah good question um i i guess how how people arrive at me or how people present is probably a better way of putting it it's normally that they want to lose some weight and so then you have to unpack how the weight came about yeah and so that has you know that has spindles going in all sorts of directions mm. um and sometimes there's an easy fix okay well you're you know you're eating a tub of ice cream before bed every night well let's look at that or you're only getting three hours of sleep a night i've had people like that before mm. so let's unpack that let's not worry about your diet for now let's yeah. let's put that back on track um so it, it it's it's often weight they're knocking on my door mm. but the the lever that got them there is is a is a really mixed bag from from um you know there's a lot of sh inflammation through you know the environment stress food a combination of all those things yep. and so part of my my role as a as a health coach and nutritionist is to to put every put your cards all you know put all your cards on the table you know let let's you know have a bit of a uh head scratch and work out out of all those cards what are the biggest drivers for your current predicament you know if you put on weight you know you want to lose 10 kilos where predominantly has that 10 kilos come from is it your poor sleep or is it your lack of exercise is it you know your diet or you know or is it that you're you have such proclivity to certain types of foods that have this um yeah. you know that that you've in you've inhabited this sort of proclivity to a certain type of food for 30 40 50 years that you yeah. know how do we un unravel that like they've probably been suppressing emotions and trauma yeah. and all sorts of things too all ties yeah. into it. it's very um i mean that's why there's always diet books right and i'm guilty because i've written i've written a few <laughs> <laughs> there's always an appetite you know yeah. and, and let me tell you you know i don't want to throw my publisher under the bus but i will <laughs> i never wanted to call any of my books such and such diet mm. but they know they're the you know the sales department of their their publishing house know that you put diet in the title yeah. it's gonna sell you know my my book the keto diet it sold pretty well because a it was the time for keto to be under the spotlight and have its time in the sun and it had the word diet in it yep. Yep. my my the premise for the book wasn't the such and such diet it was like how do we let's look at inflammation how do we mitigate that let's not avoid inflammation but how do we mitigate that and protect us from mm. Ill health and disease and drive us more towards optimal health yeah but that's not a catchy title. Of course not. I mean, it, it, a more appropriate one, and probably it probably wouldn't sell any books. Would be like 
let's look at the reasons why you're you know, you've got this excess weight or let's take some self-responsibility for that yeah. fact or whatever you just can't yeah. do that you need to, you need to nah. make sure where they're at obviously i mean i'm going to do a shameless self-plug here now this is my yoga book and oh, very uh, nice. And I've got, you know, discovering your yoga nature. And that's just really simple because that's about like what talks about all the stuff that you talk about, you know, sustainable yoga practice, you know, aligning yourself with the seasons and the meridians and the energies of the earth that we're made of. So, um, and there were plenty of other titles that I could have gone with and I self-published that. But um, yeah, you've again, we don't want to bombard people too much at this time because they're already dealing with, you know, so much stuff emotionally, mentally, physically and spiritually too. So I think what you're doing, I mean, let's get back to the, the good farm sh dot shop. I mean, how can people get your food into their bellies and how can they get in touch with you? And if they want to have a session with you or you're not doing that at the moment, are you focusing more on the on the online stuff? Um, I'm not doing all that much coaching because I'm so busy with the, the cooking side of things, but but I love it, you know, like help, helping someone gives um, gives me an incredible degree of satisfaction. Um, but but uh, most of our time and energy is on the the good farm. So uh, to find us, it's we just changed our domain, which has been um, more hassle than it's worth. But so you can find us at www.thegoodfarm.com. Oh shit, thegoodfarmshop.com. Oh, was it that? Because it was the good farm dot shop. So it's a good farm no. com. Yeah. Okay, I'll put it in the show notes so we don't get confused there as well. With a good farm shop on Instagram. Okay. That's that's probably the best place to find us. Okay, great. Yeah. Any final words of foodie wisdom, Scott, for viewers on behalf of yourself and Matilda? Yeah, I, I always think about whether this is wisdom or not. Is I'll leave that to the listeners. But I always think about maybe, you know, I was referencing this person earlier who's – who wants change, who wants to feel better, who maybe wants to lose some weight or shop more consciously. Um, it doesn't have to happen overnight and you don't have to nail it from the get go. It's yeah. just about making small incremental steps. Like, as I said, like every, every decision and action is a little, there's a little T intersection, mm -hmm. right? So you can go, oh, okay, I'm going to go my normal path whatever that is of non-exercise or not drinking that water or you know not buying consciously or you can try something different and so it's not about yeah it's definitely not about nailing it 100 percent of the time because if you have that expectation you're sort of setting yourself up for, for failure and we don't want to do that we want to set people up for success and so any any little adjustment in the positive direction is a win and you should clock that up. You should chalk that, chalk that up mentally. And, and so they start to accumulate and you start to feel good about the decisions that you're making. Yeah. That's it's great advice, Scott. It's um, advice for, for any of us, at, no matter what age and stage we're at in life. Cause I think we, we do as, as humans too, especially with all the stuff that's been going on, there's a lot of pressure on everybody to conform and do the right thing and, and sacrifice themselves. And one of the first things that we do is we sacrifice our health, especially as women, as mothers, and also as fathers and dads and partners, et cetera, as well. So there's nothing wrong with, you know, selfishness in a positive self-loving way. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually imperative at this point, I think. I think, yeah, that's a really, really good point. For sure. It's been great to talk to you and Matilda as well. Um, I really look forward to connecting with you again soon. And um, yeah, thank you for everything you're doing for everybody on the right. farm and on the beaches. All right. Thank, thanks for having us, Debbie. Thank you. Thanks, darling.